which are already used in use in education or which could be used or which might be usable in education so it will be also a kind of an experimental session where uh, you are not only invited to listen but also invited to contribute. We have uh, happily very many presentations in this short uh, two hours, actually six, uh, so we need to be uh, very careful uh, with the time and we are already uh, in uh, late. Uh, but uh, what will help our speakers is that that the last presentation, uh, uh, which uh, I uh, share as a co-author with uh, Diego uh, Lieban, uh, was also scheduled as a plenary talk for tomorrow morning, because one of our plenary speakers uh, unfortunately cannot be here. So we will uh, present you to today just a short uh, foretaste and in a more experimental manner. We will raise up uh, our questions where you would be invited uh, to, to contribute and help us. But the bigger picture uh, we will present uh, tomorrow morning as the first uh, plenary talk. So uh, I'm Christoph Fenvesi, as all of you uh, knows it, but it's my great honor uh, to introduce uh, you uh, Professor uh, Noah Dana uh, Picard uh, from uh, Jerusalem, uh, from the uh, Jerusalem College uh, of uh, Technology, uh, where uh, he's uh, a chairman of uh, Institution of uh, Mathematics and uh, uh, for former chairman, and uh, but have uh, many other uh, present uh, duties, and we will share the chairmanship uh, for this session. And this is a great honor uh, for all of us. And as uh, Noah is our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, he will talk about a glimpse at mathematics in Jewish traditional artifacts and also its educational relevance in uh, Israeli uh, mathematics education. The floor is yours, Noah, and you have your... Uh, Thank you, speaker. It works. <coughs> Switch it on. Uh, no. Turn it off. Turn it off. I don't know. It's off. He has to turn, he's turn yours on. Yeah, you can turn it a Now it's on. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, I must say that this man is responsible for our presence here. <laughs> and uh, another man, he and Jolt, they are responsible for my work in this field. So if you are not pleased with what I say, they are responsible. Okay? Who am I as a politician? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm not a candidate. <laughs> well, uh, this is really a, a very, very uh, Im important field, and what I will tell you is uh, some glimpses, but not more, and at some times you will have to stop me. So please, uh, let's say four minutes before I have really to stop, if I didn't arrive to something, I want to arrive to something that is at the end. Well, first of all, I must, I must say that uh, the problem of the, existing, the existence of Jewish art is not a trivial uh, issue for many reasons. One of them is a historical reason. It's because some kind of art you will not find in Jewish history. Big monuments you cannot. And the big monuments existing here in Europe exist only from the middle of the 19th century, but not before. For example, the, the, the main synagogue in Rome has been built when the ghetto has been closed there. And then there was, there was no Jewish architect who was able to do that. And the, the, the biggest synagogue in Europe is in Budapest. We will see it now. Uh, it has been built in the 19th century and rebuilt uh, in the last years. But uh, you, you could not. And why? <laughs> the simple thing is that Jews have been expelled from place to place. So to build a monument was useless. And the, generally, the, the king or the emperor uh, didn't allow to do that. For, for example, here in Vienna, the first expulsion was in uh, 14 and something like that, and then another one in 1600 uh, and something like that, and the last one, we know when it was. 
So this is one of the programs. The second program is uh, that uh, to make some kind of representation of what exists on the earth is forbidden by the, by the Bible, by the Torah, and uh, in particular to have sculptures. It's, it's impossible. So we will we'll not find. What we can, we can find across the centuries is uh, books, and limited books, and, and some kinds of buildings of artifacts, of religious artifacts, and that's what I want to describe for you. The first uh, important re representation is as mathematicians we know that uh, two-dimensional is different from three-dimensional. So in some kinds uh, of representation we can, have a, we can have pictures but no sculptures. Uh, therefore, we can find these kind of, uh, of artifacts, but not these ones. But th that's not a problem. Uh, across the centuries, we can find a lot of, uh, of a lot of examples. I bring only a few of them. This was formerly a synagogue in Toledo, Spain. But after the Jews have been expelled from them, the, this building has been transformed into a church. So we have so, some kind of. Uh, of forms. Here we have uh, an arc of circle, we have pillars, and the, all these uh, forms are present in a lot of synagogues in Europe today, and uh, synagogues in Firenze in, uh, uh, or in other places because the Moorish style has been uh, adopted. Or oh, this is part of, uh, of the shrine in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, we can see all the symmetries existing in the various uh, elements here. The main one has a lot of different symmetries. And here there are also in the corners four different ones. Here it's a, a Hebrew verse, probably taken from the Bible. Uh, and uh, this kind of, uh, of, this, of uh, artifact can be found not only in Cairo, but in all the Mediterranean basin. Uh, well, uh, other things that we can find are the, uh, the ornaments for the Torah scrolls, the, the Holy Torah, which is handwritten, and on that I want to, to, to say a few words at the end. This is, this is a crown. It, it's made of silver. Uh, it's totally with a rotational symmetry all around, but uh, for, of course inside there are different <coughs> motifs, and these different motifs from time to time they find a very nice tessellation. Uh, we have here another one. This is a, 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 Torah, uh, a Torah box, uh, which is made of wood, but uh, this wood is overlaid with, uh, with silver. And here we have some corals. And inside, uh, we have a tessellation by squares, but inside every square, there are geometrical uh, uh, forms. Actually, mathematics is, is uh, ubiquitous in, uh, in uh, Bible and in Talmud. In Bible it's quite hard, but in Talmud it's, uh, it's very, very spread out. Uh, a lot of things connected to, to uh, computing the calendar, or uh, some kinds of uh, prerequisites for the, the, the way of thinking of infinitesimal calculus is present in the, some tractate of the, of the Talmud. And uh, about that, here on the, on the right, I will say a few words afterwards. It's connected to the golden section and to the, uh, and to the Fibonacci numbers. But first of all, uh, you must know that uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, a numerical value is given to every letter. And that there is an importance to the, of how to compute the numerical value of words, of sentences, of verses. And this is a way of comparing verses and the, the internal meaning. It's, a, it's not an esoteric way, it's a very uh, est well established and there are rules for that. And uh, I, did, I wanted only to show you this example. The, the word Ahava says love. It is built on the, on the letters that you can see in the first row. And this, this is an Aleph, the, the same Aleph that uh, is used in mathematics. And then the Aleph, his value is one. The second letter is bet, the, his value is two. And so you, can, uh, you have Aleph who is one, bet who is two, Aleph plus bet is three. But then you have the He whose value is five. And if you want Aleph plus He plus bet, you have eight. And the whole world, Ahava, Rav, 
if you serve to him, this is the beginning of the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, therefore, one of the main rabbis in Israel today, he's also a, a, uh, he holds a PhD in physics, in modern physics, uh, he calls these numbers, not Fibonacci numbers, but the numbers of love. And, uh, and he makes a, a huge use of Fibonacci numbers, of numbers of love, in order to explain a lot of things appearing in the Talmud. But uh, we know also that uh, the golden section is called divine pro proportion, but um, many people don't know that this name has been quoted at first by a priest, uh, Luca Bartolome Spaccioli in Italy, and he decided to call that divine proportion without any connection with geometry. Uh, it's very interesting to know. That you know, that uh, only a reminder that Fibonacci uh, numbers and golden section are ubiquitous uh, everywhere in nature. You don't need me to tell that. Uh, but uh, you know that it exists also in uh, architecture. Generally, people mention the, the Parthenon the, of the pyramid. We heard something about that yesterday. Uh, for the cathedral in Paris, and it's present in the Taj Mahal in India. It's at every place in, on earth, so it's very, very important. Even in Epidaurus, in the, the theater, the number of rows of seats are Fibonacci numbers. It's probably also, not, not only the number of rows, but some different, some other <coughs> uh, physical characteristics provide the fact that audition there, the, the, the auditive qualities of this theater are especially nice. If you are standing at some place here and you can speak like that, everybody will hear. Therefore, if you go there as a tourist, it's forbidden for you to sing there. And if you try to do it, I was, I witnessed that, that a lady came and began to sing an opera song there. Immediately, people came and asked her to leave. Uh, it's forbidden. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so what in Jewish life, the, these kind of things happen already in Noah's Ark. We couldn't without that. Because the length is 50 cubits and the height is 30 cubits and 50 over 30 is 5 over 3. This is equal to 1.666. It's an approximation of the golden section. We have it with the Holy Ark, the Ark of Covenant, because the, the length is two and a half cubits and the, 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 the width is one and a, and a half cubits and the ratio is the same approximation. At that time, we, we, have, we must know that uh, at, in the ancient times, people didn't know what is an irrational, numbers, uh, an irrational number and uh, generally approximations were used and this is not so bad, at least for regular people like me who use a regular ruler in order to measure, so it's a good approximation. We have it also for the copper altar in the, in the desert, the tabernacle in the, in the desert, which is squared, and here we have five cubits, and here we have three cubits, the same proportions exist there. Well, uh, it exists also in some other places. It, uh, it is sufficient for me to appear at some places and people identify me uh, because I'm wearing this kind of fringes. And what I'm, I'm wearing here is exactly what I'm representing there. So there is a command in the Bible to have, when we have uh, some kind of, uh, of clothes, to have there four fringes in the corners. And the corners, uh, and the fringes has to, have to be uh, with a, a blue thread. The, because this blue thread reminds of the sea, which reminds of the sky, which reminds of the throne of God. Uh, there are some kinds of ways to make the knots, but this is uh, the way of making knots that we have, which has been described by Maimonides in uh, the 13th century or the 14th century, and it's also connected. Uh, it's connected to to aesthetics because there's this blue, uh, this, this mixing of blue and white is uh, supposed to be really aesthetic, and uh, the number of knots that exist there we have to have th uh, at least seven series of three knots and at most 13. 
13 is, an, is a Fibonacci number, and if we have only 7, 7 times 3 is 21, which is also a Fibonacci number, there are other connections because the, uh, finally I have here uh, 8 threads uh, times 4 is 32, and with, uh, I can make a lot of computations, but to uh, at this step it's nonsense. Uh, I, or it will take all the time I have today to, to speak. So I will not. I will not do that. There are connections with Fibonacci numbers, and, and, the, and the golden section is the proportions of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Actually, there was there were two temples: one built by Solomon the king, and the other one built after the Jews came back from exile in Babylon. Uh, the dimensions are uh, are somehow different, but and and the and the plot is not symmetric, it's not a rectangle, but and there it's possible to find the, the, the golden ratio, but not in a straightforward way, therefore I don't enter that, the paper has been written on that and can be found, uh, not by me, and can be found on the internet. But uh, what is interesting is that in the Bible, in the, in the Torah part of the Bible, there are at least three kinds of border lines described for the land of Israel. And that with one of these kind, uh, where the, the northern border line is about uh, the, 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 the town named Tyr, uh, the distance from the Holy Temple to the northern border line, over the distance from the Holy Temple to the southern border line, is equal to the golden ratio. And uh, the, the, the Talmud in the Tractate Sukkah says that. Uh, if somebody didn't see the temple that Herod, the king, built, uh, he never saw in his life what is a beautiful building. So the aesthetics is very important there. But there are also other things. Yesterday we, we heard uh, something about the, the cubit used in Egypt for the building of the pyramids and so on. Actually, you know that we can have um, the, you know, you know this figure. The, we have here a, a pentagon, but inside we have also what is called the pentagram. The pentagram is this five, this five uh, vertices star, and uh, actually uh, within that we have the golden section appearing in a lot of times. And uh, in particular, the, oh, in particular uh, we have the length of this diagonal over the side is equal to the golden section. But actually, when you are going through this broken line, every time you have, for two subsequent segments, you have the golden ratio. And these are exactly the measures, the, the, the official measures used in the Bible. You have here the cubit, and you have here the foot, and here you have this distance, and then you have this distance, and then you have the finger, and so on. These are the, the different, it's not a decimal way of working, but it's based totally on the golden ratio. Uh, you can see that here with the finger, here with the, the cubit and the hand, and so on. So there are people who say that this pentagram exists also uh, for, in geography, and for example here it's the southern part of France, uh, close to the borderline with Spain, where uh, four, four uh, five fortresses are uh, the vertices of uh, one of a pentagram. There are other examples like that. I must apologize for having said that there are four, but you know that there are three kinds of mathematicians, those who know how to compute and those who don't know. Uh, uh, well, uh, so I said that uh, no monuments, no, no big things like that for uh, for the Jewish history, but violin for sure there is, because first of all, it was quite easy to take the violin when you, when you are expelled, and to take a piano is uh, quite harder. Uh, but uh, probably the proportion of, of Stradivarius, various violin, uh, the proportion of the golden section, and this can explain something else. Uh, we, we talked uh, today with somebody about the place where the, the, where the Leonardo da Vinci is buried and where he was born and so on. There is a connection with the Mona Lisa, but uh, I will not speak about that. Well, this is the main synagogue in Budapest, the biggest synagogue in Europe. 
It has been built on a non-rectangular plot, and therefore the architect has to make very, uh, a lot of efforts because the, the praying hall has generally to be symmetric. It's so symmetric that even the chair from where the rabbi is giving his sermon is doubled. Generally there is only one, but here uh, in these kind of synagogues, generally there is none. But in these kind of synagogues there, there is generally one, here there are two, and everything is totally symmetrical. The main facade is not because of the requirements of the plot, but in the facade, the center part is totally symmetric. It is symmetric with one arc here, and then, no, please pay attention. There is one arc, and this arc, and all these ones, are in a style which has been defined in Germany in the 19th century as Rundbogenstil. We have something uh, rectangular, and over there, half a circle. This kind of thing can be found also in old synagogues in Jerusalem and in other parts of the world. So we have here one arc, but on, on the two sides we have two towers. In these towers we have windows. Here, two parts, two high parts, and over there, three round parts. Pay attention, I only mention Fibonacci numbers. Here we have five windows. Here we have only one and only one. But the towers here have eight faces. And uh, I don't know whether, the, whether the, the architects thought about Fibonacci when he planned this building, but when something is so essential for aesthetics, people in a natural way, and we heard that yesterday, that something appears in nature, something which is a big creature in the world is something very, very essential, and it's that this is the way of doing that. I would like to draw your attention to this part. Generally, a rosace is made of arcs of circles, and this is not. We have, uh, everything seems to have some kind of circular, uh, of rotational symmetry, but we have also straight lines and a lot of polygons. The, the tessellations that we have here is very, very interesting. We can find that in other places, but behind the, the, this synagogue is a place where there is a monument in memory of uh, Raoul Wallenberg who rescued a lot of uh, Hungarian Jews when uh, the German arrived. Uh, and uh, this monument is made of a, of a first part inside which is totally solid, which is totally symmetric, inscribed in a rectangle and made of two parts like that. This is totally symmetric, but the color. But around there is a, it's not a sculpture, but it's an installation which, whose name is the, the Tree of Life. And this tree, you can see it on the picture, this tree is not symmetric. It cannot be. And actually we have something symmetric in, this, in the center, but something which evokes, we symbolize life which is not symmetric. Life does not stand symmet total symmetry. Something does not exist. We have only one heart and it's one, on one side. We have only one liver, it's on the other side. And even when the, we are s saying that a beautiful man or woman is totally symmetric and experiments have been done with art artists, with, uh, with uh, film, uh, with movies, stars, and so on. Actually, always something non-symmetric is done. I'm trying to do it non-symmetric. And uh, tell it to my wife. And uh, so you, you can see uh, I chose a couple of synagogues in, uh, in Central Europe that, which uh, can show this guy. This one, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Mitrovsky Mikulash. Uh, this one, I, I, I think that, uh, in this one, I was lucky enough to visit. Uh, so here we have the Greek proportions. Uh, here we have not. But always something is done in order to make the symmetry smoother. Because if everything is built on squares, then this is the totalitarian architecture. Yes, Hitler yes. and other one in our generation. We know which kind of uh, very, very heavy symmetries they have, so every, every time something else is done. 
This is a synagogue in, in Jerusalem where uh, we have this kind of Rundbogel steel, but something uh, disrupts uh, the steel. Here in the middle, it's not a circle like here and here. Here it's a cycloid. And here is another synagogue in the same part of Jerusalem, but uh, here we have the, the, the central part where the Torah scrolls are red. Uh, here it's totally rectangular. Here it's elliptic. So the ellipse, uh, it's more human, let's say. Uh, you remember the number of windows in Budapest and so on? This is an old synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem. We have here three parts and then five parts and so on. Exactly the same kind of things. Well, uh, the Torah scrolls are written by hand. And uh, the text is not written as a sequence, as a, in, a, in a, how to say, in a serial proceeding process. But uh, sometimes it's written in serial process, line after line, row after row, well, uh, like every regular book that we know, but sometimes not. This is a country that uh, the people of Israel sang on the Red Sea after, uh, during the Exodus. It has to, to explain, to, to express joy and happiness, and so it has to be stable. And this stability is expressed in the written, in the writing, because this writing uh, looks like the way you are building a wall. You don't put the stones one above the other, but you are putting them exactly the same way you have here, the writing and the blanks. So this uh, evokes stability. Here, it's a part of the Bible where uh, there is a lot of curses. It's awful what is written there, and uh, it's a thread. So it's built like if you put one stone above the other, because such a wall will fall. It, uh, the, the symbolism here in that, in the writing, the symbolism in that, uh, something happy will stay along the time, something unhappy will always end. Uh, and we have proofs in our history. Well, uh, the, the two tables of the covenant, which uh, Moses came from the Mount Sinai, are generally represented as Moses came in uh, something like that. Yes? But, uh, okay, nobody was there, but uh, nobody, a lot of people were there, and we are witnesses. But uh, in order to, to, to represent them, uh, it's a long range discussion. Uh, so, uh, and they wanted to, put, to make them symmetric, and the commentators, uh, all the, the, from uh, uh, a lot of centuries ago, say that they were totally symmetric. But in order to, to have them symmetric, we have ten commandments. But the, five, the, the first five are longer than the, 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 the last five. So how can you write them? So the, the, uh, one decision could be, uh, don't write them. Write them uh, only by the numbers. Here it's in Prague, and it's Roman numbers. Uh, sometimes it's only the numbers. I said that the Hebrew letters have a numerical value. So sometimes it's only the letters. So they decided uh, maybe to put only one word, but uh, the, then the, the, the word which would have been on the left part would have been no, 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 no. <coughs> it's ugly. It's impossible to do that. So the, here are some of the, of the decisions of, uh, of the way the, the architects did the job. And uh, but somebody with the modern lasers, inclusion in plastics, and uh, in, 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 uh, other materials tried to have, according to, to some commentators, that there were two tables, but everything was written on both. And so symmetry is preserved, but even if it is not, there was a long discussion by Rabbi Moshe, Moshe Ben Yosef Ditrani 400 years ago, how to write in order to somehow preserve the symmetry. So letters here should be smaller than there, and the, the blanks should be bigger here than there, and so on. Uh, the, the symmetry problem was omnipresent. It's very, very important. And I will finish with that. What is the, the relevance of what I explained now to math education? We have in Israel part of the population, uh, about 10 or 12 percent of the population, 
uh, where children and students learn only Jewish studies in what is called higher Talmudic institutions. But now a uh, part of them are wanting, uh, wishing to come to academy or to other kind of, uh, of institution in order to learn mathematics, English, computer science, and, uh, and other professional accomplishments. And so we have a, a lot of time we have to, to deal with them. So the, the best way to present them mathematics is to present them in a way which fits their way of life and their way of thinking. So if we, if we can present them the mathematics included in the Talmud, if we can present them the, the mathematics and the geometry and the symmetries and the, uh, present in, the, in the, the traditional religious artifacts, so it speaks to them because they, this is their world. Uh, I cannot explain anything to these kind of students if I take my examples from the music of Beethoven or from, the, or from the, what is made in Hollywood. Yeah. Okay, they heard about Hollywood, but not more than that. Between us, it's not so bad. But uh, maybe the stars, because the stars are pentagrams. And, uh, but uh, so we can we can do something with them, and we can uh, approach them, and we can build uh, something which is in phase with their everyday way of life. So it has a lot of advantages. Maths do not contradict the orthodox way of life. Do, do, maths do not contradict the orthodox way of thinking. They can be conveyed using objects of students' everyday life as examples. People who have learned Talmud, this is very important for years, are accustomed to logical reasoning. And even in the Talmud, you, you can have not the Greek reasoning that everything is either black or white, either true or false. But what mathematicians are developing during the last years with fuzzy logic is exactly the logic of the Talmud. Uh, something which can, be, uh, which can be both true and false, but the proportion is something which is important. And so uh, this is a, a good way teaching mathematics to, to these children and to these students. This is a good way to bring them to afterwards be educated in an academic environment and uh, to, to discover uh, finally this will also enrich their way of, of, of studying the talent. That's it for today. Thank you very much. Professor Dana Thierry Picard. It was a very interesting uh, lecture on a field uh, which we don't know uh, yet, uh, probably in that uh, depth, uh, as uh, it will be uh, known uh, probably following uh, this kind of uh, deep uh, lectures on uh, symmetries uh, and symmetry studies uh, on uh, Jewish art. Uh, we quite much run uh, over time, uh, so I would like to ask uh, one short question and one short answer. And if we can save some time to the end, we will have uh, some overall discussion. But uh, is there any comments or questions, just in short? Okay, the first comes, first one takes. One question or comment. You spent a lot of time showing the relevance of Fibonacci numbers, uh, showing that they are everywhere in your realm, but uh, the Ten Commandments are no Fibonacci number. Ten, did, ten didn't you re recognize? You did not mention that this fully ruins your full induction. No, because Ten Commandments is twice five. So two Fibonacci numbers. But that way you can uh, analyze I, everything. I, I describe the situation. I describe numbers which, which appear. Can. Meanwhile, I. Oh, sorry. Meanwhile, I describe a situation. Can. Ten is twice five. Two times five. It's two, two Fibonacci numbers. I describe the situation. I don't explain it. Meanwhile, can. This is a huge work, and I'm very, very prudent in order not to go into uh, some esoteric explanations that people can, uh, what are you telling about that? Uh, some uh, aliens uh, have come and uh, explained it. So I will not do that. Uh, but what I'm convinced, 
this is true for Fibonacci numbers, it's true for fractals, it's true, it's true for a lot, not, not a lot, for some fundamental uh, mathematical features which are ubiquitous in nature, not in nature, in the world, in the universe. They are, they are true at the level of galaxies, they are true at the level of DNA, at every everything. So these uh, mathematical tools are very essential. So if, if you want, a, a, let's say, a, a, an answer of a religious man, which is which thing that he, he tries to serve God and not to, to be distant, uh, if he puts in his world uh, some central features like that, we have to, to, to search them and to understand them, and so we will arrive to understanding his world in a better way. This is not totally mathematical. Thank you very much, Noah, and we try to save some time uh, for the end. I was also especially impressed uh, your example that uh, visual poetry also existed uh, already in the Bible, and there are some people in the room who are interested in uh, poetry and uh, symmetries, literature and symmetries. Okay, uh, now I have a technical question. If uh, Eugenio Bertozzi here in the room, Eugenio Bertozzi. Uh, if he's not here, then it seems uh, that we have uh, less uh, speakers uh, in, the, uh, in the session. So this doesn't mean that we don't have to worry that much about time, but uh, maybe we may make our work a bit easier. So, my pleasure is to present, uh, introduce you, will not need to be introduced, Lawrence uh, Gould, Larry Gould. Uh, who is uh, from the University of Hartford, uh, from the physics department, and he has a huge uh, experience uh, not only studying uh, symmetries in his own field as a researcher, but also teaching uh, uh, symmetry and teaching symmetry studies not only for the specialized uh, ones, but also for poets or <laughs> for, for, for everyone. And uh, he will share uh, with us uh, some uh, interesting examples connecting uh, symmetry and music and also with uh, quite great relevance uh, with his educational practice that he developed over the uh, recent decades, if I can say so. And I will assist to Larry uh, to some experiments, so I'll try to get ready for that. Larry, the floor is yours. Am I on? Yeah. Yes, I'm no? okay. Um, well, uh, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, the title. It like um, has to do with uh, sound in music. What I, what I mean by that are basic sounds in the sense that I'll show you. And also uh, the sound of music. And if you think there's a reference to the motion picture, you're right. <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, I want to ded dedicate this to Theo Hahn and to Maya Shanitsky, both musicians in their own way. Uh, I'll certainly miss them. So, uh, what do I mean by uh, the sounds? Complex sounds are made up of simple sounds. And so, for example, the tuning fork uh, is a simple sound. This says uh, 512. To amplify it, better on the wall. Uh, and my voice is, is, a, uh, is a complex sound, much more complex than this. In what sense? Again, we'll, I'll have to show you that. So basic symmetries are uh, involved in very simple sounds, like the tuning fork. My voice is more complicated in sound. How do the sounds give rise to more complex sounds? Okay. What's the underlying structure? You know, what's the underlying structure to the atoms? What is, it consists of more basic particles? Um, so if you think of a wave, you can think of a, a water wave, for example. Um, this would be an example of a water wave made by a, a, a spring, an analogous to. And what you have, thank you, what you have is a propagation. So you set up a disturbance in something, whether it's water, whether it's the air, Okay. You set up a disturbance, and there's a travel of the disturbance, and it's a local effect. Of some springs push on other springs. Now, you also have a, a disturbance that's propagated here, again, on the right. It's called longitudinal. 
So the disturbance propagates from left to right, and the motion of the medium is also from left to right. Whereas over here, what's called transverse waves, like water wave, disturbance propagates from left to right, but the motion of the medium is perpendicular to that. Okay. So and a guitar string, for example, is associated with both types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. You pluck the string and you get transverse waves, but the strings plucked interacts with the air and that creates sound waves and they're longitudinal. So every part of the medium is, uh, is moving and what we mean by periodic waves uh, are things that are, have a certain kind of symmetry, uh, translational symmetry in space and also in time. We'll see in a second what that means, how. Well, on the upper left-hand side, what you see is a uh, sound. Let's see, wait. Am I off? OK, I need this uh, laser pointer right there. Can you use OK. So if you look at the shape over here, it repeats to the right. Now what the shape represents is imagine a water wave and you've taken a snapshot of it. And it's very uh, rep repetitive. That means you've got translational symmetry in space because you've taken a snapshot. Over here, the tuning fork has a particular uh, pitch that I showed you. And if you plot this, you have to be careful of the horizontal axis, if you plot this in time, then you also get a, uh, whoops, you also get a, uh, how do I go back? Okay, you also get a, uh, a, a periodicity, and this is translation, it's translation in time, okay, because of the time. So you have translation in space and translation in time. Now, the amplitude is a measure of the loudness of the sound. Okay, that's how high these uh, these waves are above this horizontal about the, this uh, this horizontal line. This is the amplitude, and for sound waves, it uh, pertains to loudness. And the the unit of translation is called the wavelength. So some people know about this, others don't. And so what you have it by translational symmetry in space, you mean. Uh, you can take and shift this whole pattern by one wavelength and it goes into the pattern again. So it's translation in space. Similarly, for uh, translation in sound, the tuning fork has translation in space. If you somehow to freeze the wave, then the wavelength of the sound that I produced with this, that would be about 64 centimeters from one maximum to the other, to the other maximum. For the period, however, the, t the time interval from one maximum to the next maximum is about two thousandths of a second. So the wave is moving. And this is an example of the vibration of, uh, for sound waves, the individual air molecules are vibrating. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some software packages some people might be interested in uh, later, but there's, there's not enough time to go back and forth. So I'll give you the basics first. The individual air molecules then on, do not get carried along from the source uh, over here, for example, to the receiver, which is the ear, air. They're oscillating back and forth in place, but the, the motion is passed along from molecule to molecule. Okay? And I'll skip the demo, I'll do that later. Them cell phones have tones, and these different tones uh, are associated with a frequency like the 512 hertz, that means 512 oscillations per second, the times of the tuning fork. And um, the brain interprets the frequency uh, and it's called in common parlance pitch. Okay? So the musicians think in terms of pitch usually and the physicists think in terms of frequency. So now how do you get complex sounds from simple sounds? Well, you take these translational patterns, translational space, translational time, that's done automatically, uh, and when these, when waves pass through each other, so in some places the maxima 
interfere with each other and you get a higher max in other places you might have a maximum and a minimum and they cancel out. I'll show you an example of that. Okay? So these would be uh, two tuning forks and uh, I have two tuning forks over here and uh, I can show you an interference pattern. Okay? What's going to happen is that the waves from this and the waves from this are going to go out and they're going to hit your ear. Okay? And this tuning fork and this tuning fork, they both say 512 hertz. Now it's interesting to find out, are they 512 hertz? Well, if you can't any, hear any difference in the sound, it's possible, but let's see. Now you notice the high frequency and then you hear this mmm, mm, okay, the mmm, mm, mm, that's the interference between the, uh, the two waves that are sent out by these tuning forks. So they're not the, they're not the same frequency. And if you have two speakers, then uh, what you have is you have places where this is a maximum, for example, this is a minimum. So this is a hill, this is a trough, this is a hill. And uh, if you have the maxima and the minima where they come together, okay, say a hill and a hill, you get a double hill, okay, a larger pattern. Whereas uh, if you have a situation like this here, you have a hill and a trough, they come together, is the, the hills and the troughs come together and they cancel each other out. So in, in general you have two waves that are coming together. Different places in space you have troughs coming together with hills and uh, troughs coming together with troughs at other places, hills coming together with hills at other places. And so in general throughout the room there's going to be places where the sound is louder than normal, other places where the sound is not as loud. Okay. And this is the example that I showed you um, orally, okay? Uh, these two tuning forks are actually very, very slightly different in frequency. And when they come together, they produce this, uh, a wave pattern that looks like this. Now the higher frequency that you see is this, the, these, uh, these wiggles that are closer together. But the lower frequency, the mm -hmm that you heard, that's from this maximum, you see, if you, to this maximum, okay. And that's called the beat frequency. I'll just skip that, okay. Now what happens, uh, to give you a simple example of uh, I interference, okay. If you pluck a guitar string, then a wave travels from left to right, okay. But when it hits the end, where it's tied down, it flips upside down, travels from right to left. But the waves that keep traveling from left to right and right to left, well, they intersect with each other. So there's inter interference that takes place. And one thing you get, so for the guitar, so you get something like this. If, you, uh, if it's tied down over here, however, you want to get a different note on the guitar string, so what you do is you put your finger somewhere else. Okay? And what that does, it gives you the same pattern. This pattern, I call it a, we call it a one loop. Uh, that's what refers to the fundamental. That's the basic sound that you hear. And that's the fundamental or first harmonic. And I won't show you that. Here is the example of the fundamental for a plucked string. And then the, the next harmonic that you get is twice the fundamental, twice the frequency of the fundamental. The next is three times. You can't get them in between, okay? And I can show that to you with the help of Christoph. Okay, so Christoph, what you do is that you just stand at this end and you hold the hold that there. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I wiggle this up and down. And when I wiggle it, I'm wiggling it at some one frequency, this frequency. Okay, that's fairly low frequency. And this is a one loop mode. You see, uh, that's a time stop picture. Okay. Now, if I wiggle it faster, then I can produce uh, this mode. But I have to wiggle it the correct frequency, a higher frequency, and it has to be twice the first frequency. So let's give it a shot. Okay, so you just hold stand there. Okay, so that's, that's the n equal to, or the second harmonic. Okay. Now, we're going to produce the, the third harmonic, I'm going to try anyway. 
third harmonic, okay? Okay, now there's certain places here and here where the, the string is at rest. That means you have a destructive interference at those points. And so this is what happens. This is uh, in, a, in a string, okay? It also happens related to the human voice because the human voice has these different frequencies. The complex sounds have the frequency, different frequencies that are built up out of the simple frequencies that I showed you before, the pattern of. Okay, so let's see. And an example then is this, uh, this the simple frequencies, when you add them up, and I'll show you how to add them in a, in a little bit, they go into producing some complex sound like that. And this is a result of, you see this, this pattern that I showed you earlier, the simple pattern? This is, a, they're called sine waves, okay? And this has a larger amplitude than this you know, bigger hills than this. And if you plot the, uh, the various frequencies that can occur, the various waves, then you get a first harmonic, a second harmonic, a third harmonic, and a higher harmonic. And each of the harmonics has different amplitudes. And it's the pattern, it's the fingerprint of the, of the amplitudes of the harmonics along with the different frequencies that gives you a particular complex sound. So let's see. Um, that's, I think now I can get into my, uh, I, I get into the, uh, the software package, I'm ready to get into software, but there's a, there's a nice little example, reference to poetry, okay, uh, so what we've done so far, we've started with a, with a simple sounds, we've seen uh, the symmetrical aspects translational, uh, symmetry, we found how they can produce more complex sounds, which also display symmetries. Okay. And this can be seen to some extent in nature, uh, and this was uh, written hundreds of years ago, this uh, part of the poem. Uh, if you think of it, you drop a rock into a, a quiet pond that sends that circles out, and the circles hit other circles and they generate more circles. So, as when a stone troubling the quiet waters points in the angry stream a wrinkle round, which soon another and another scatter, till all the lake with circles now is crowned. Now comes the analogy. Also the air struck with some violence nigh begets a world of circles in the sky. So now let me show you what the, uh, how the software goes. Okay, this is, imagine two speakers, what happened to my speakers here? Okay, let's say I have to move it down. Um, whoops. Let me try that again. Should I unplug that? No, I need to plug it in. See, ignore. Let's see if I can go from here. Okay, sound. Excuse me. Oh, test the loudness. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, so um, I have two. I want uh, two speakers here, and that's here. Now, why isn't it separating? That's very strange. Separated. These should be. These should be uh, separated. Is there any way? Hmm. Well, okay. Let's go with what the way it is now. If I put a detect, let's say I put two detectors in here, and let's move one over here, and let's move one over here, and this one will put over there and this one we'll put over here. Okay, now if I turn these, so, um, somehow just,
Okay, let me let me just turn on one. So these uh, these two detectors then are uh, detecting waves that are produced by one source. Now, if I could somehow get to the other source, I'm not sure I can get to the other. Um, let's see if I can turn that on. Ah, here we go. Now, if I turn, if I move, nah, I don't have them interfering. It's not, uh, it's somehow not separating. Is it, is there anything that one can do with the, with the picture? This should be spread out. Full screen? Yeah, this is full screen. Okay, well, uh, yeah, no, it's not the sound, it's not the sound, it's, uh, this, sh this should be showing, we're showing before, but something happened in between here and there, but what I can show you is th this making waves, okay, this seems to be separated, and um, this is the simple sound. What does a simple sound sound like? Can I turn up the sound here? Yes. Did yes. I turn up the sound here? No. Here? This one? Yeah. Well, the other one was working. Is there any overtime? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let me let me get out of that. Um, Okay, so that's that's a sound, and uh, I can add to this. I can add another sine wave, and this is the resultant pattern, and that's a result of them adding together. And you can keep doing this, and you get different you can get different sounds this way. So this is the building up of the complex sounds by uh, the simple sounds, and I'll finally end with. Um, This is, this is the sound of music, rather the sound in music. So these simple sounds, the notes, are built, uh, are, are, these are simple sounds uh, are actually more complicated sounds that come up from a range of frequencies. And if you look at, um, if you look at this pattern, this is from the Well-Tempered Clavier by J.S. Bach. And uh, this, 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 and this, uh, that's repeated in the next, in the next measure, and so on, okay? And this is the, tr uh, this is the bass clef, and this pattern here, this pattern here, 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 that's also repeated in the next measure, except that the notes are different, okay? And that's what will make it louder.
Okay, so if you just had this on, then you get uh, you get one pattern. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's stop that, and now let's get off of this and get onto this, and. This is the bass. So there's a repetition then. There's a translational invariance. Actually, one measure goes into the other measure in rhythm, not in, not in sound necessarily. Okay. Okay, now let's put them together. And this is uh, the prelude in the sea from the well-tempered cl clavier. I won't play the whole thing, but you'll hear how it sounds. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You can hear the repetition. Four, one, three, four. One, two, three, four. that what was the name of the software uh, you have you have used well which one I have I have three okay. I, I have three different packages I um, one is a PHET you can set up Packages like what I showed you, and you can put on uh, for the music. The musicians might find this interesting. You can make your own um, little composition, and you can easily play it back. Um, and if anyone has any problem, just contact me. I'll be glad to uh, help you download. Okay. Uh, any short question or comment from the audience? If there is no at the moment, then uh, until Hans Wazer setting up, I just have a short comment uh, about this uh, interference uh, problem and how the sound uh, transforms. That, for example, a very interesting uh, example uh, for this in some certain uh, traditions of Arabian and also African drumming. For example, when two drummers uh, play together a polyrhythmic uh, uh, beat, and uh, also uh, these drums are often tuned uh, for some uh, wavelength, it often happens uh, that that phenomena that the two drums interfering, yeah. and the third uh, pattern emerge uh, based yeah. on these two drums, and it's also changed the beat. Uh, of what we hear, and also a third uh, drum's voice appear, and uh, this is also adds up to the spiritual experience of, of, of drumming, and it might be a good uh, example uh, uh, for you, which is also not from European culture, but uh, from other uh, other cultures, and uh, this is a very interesting also experience it in life 
uh, it's, it's a quite uh, spiritual <laughs> uh, experience. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Larry, for the uh, interesting talk. Uh, we got uh, useful information uh, from that also in connection with uh, the softwares and how to build, uh, for example, laboratories, uh, yes. uh, simulations for students uh, in an educational setting. So it was very useful. Uh, and uh, my pleasure is to uh, present you uh, uh, Hans Walser uh, from the uh, University of Basel uh, in Switzerland and uh, he will introduce us uh, uh, his uh, puzzles and uh, dissections. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay? Wait. Thank you. Now, uh, there will be a handout and I apologize for the German text, but it's very simple to explain. You cut out, for instance, the equilateral drawing of these parts, and you rearrange them in form of a regular hexagon. And here, the same thing in an inverse situation. You will find this on my home page with the English text. Just dissect one figure into the other one. And now, my main problem, Passes and dissections. I will tell you some features I did with my teacher training at Basel University. First, very well known, the theorem of Pythagoras. You see, we can dissect these two squares and fit the parts into the big square. But now, the theorem of Pythagoras holds also for other figures, for instance, equilateral triangles. And I've never seen a dissection for this case. How can you do it? It's possible. Here you see the solution. This equilateral triangle in the center and these six parts around it. And of course, if you have tried it with equilateral triangles, you can try other figures. For instance, we will uh, hear about uh, a lot of regular pentagons or regular hexagons. There's just a difference containing the number of colors you need. You see here in the center, I have only three colors, but if I'm going back to the pentagons, I need five colors. Of course, I could have made this also in yellow. But then it's, I think the beauty is, is not, no more here. Here I need five colors in the center. Here only two colors with pentagons, seven colors. The reason is very simple. Five and seven are primes and six is not. So with the octagons, it's simple again, just with two colors in the center. If I'm trying to uh, donagons, then we have overlapping here, so I stop here. Just one additional feature. You see here, blue, dark blue, right triangles. And especially these two are always in the same situation. And these dark blue, right triangles are just one fourth of the initial right triangle we use in the theorem of Pythagoras. So, different dissections, dissection proofs of the theorem of Pythagoras. Of course, it holds also with squares, and we can compare it. This is my solution, this is the classical solution. You see, this is more difficult, but for instance here, this big yellow is just the yellow here, and the dark blue here. Now, another example. The very well-known teacher's triangle, 99% of problems with right angle triangles deal with the 3, 4, 5 triangle. Here we have already a dissection proof. I have 25 squares, but we can do it as well with equilateral triangles. Again, with 25 small equilateral triangles, and the main challenge is just to color them in a mostly symmetrical way. But there are other solutions. Here you see 
I need less parts. We have a rotational symmetry, threefold rotational symmetry, both in these triangles and as well in this one. Here, an asymmetric solution with only four different parts, but there is no symmetry at all. And here, just another example with squares. You see the area of this square equals to the rectangle here, and of course of this one here. And now I have a section that, that, such that this rectangle goes into this one. And now we have a long symmetry. Here in the squares, we have a symmetry about the point, about the center. We can rotate about 180 degrees. Here in every rectangle as well, we have here a center and here a center. And there are more features. From this rectangle to the corresponding square, we can move by translations. Every part can be moved by translation and always in the same direction. So we have a slanting road where everything works. And again, on this side, you see here the slanting road in this direction. Here, I use a lot of colors. And the question is, can I do it with less colors? Now, we remember there is a famous theorem, the four color theorem, which says that every geographical map you can color with four colors only. Does this hold here also? It does because we have not only one map, we have two. We have the squares here and the big square here. So it should fit in both the sections. I can show this with a very simple example. Here you see these two figures, and now I have a dissection with squares. We have 12 red, 12 blue squares, so 24 squares. And here, of course, I use only two colors. But if I change in this situation, you see I need really five colors. Of course, on the left side, I could take here yellow as well. It, this should be possible. But then, if you go on the right side, if this is yellow, we have yellow over yellow, so it doesn't work. Or here on the right side, this red rectangle, we can make it either in blue or in yellow. But if you go on the left side, blue doesn't work, yellow doesn't work here. So we need, in this example, five colors. And there is an open problem with the sections, two-dimensional sections, what's the minimum of required number of colors? So it's at least five. If you remember, the four-color problem was very, very heavy to prove, so I didn't try even to find a general proof of this question. For me, it's just an open question. Now, just another problem. I begin with a classical dissection due to units more than 100 years ago, and you now you can do it with a model with hinges, and you can open this square, I have here drawn three intermediate situations, and at the end, you have an equilateral triangle. If I skip the thing in the middle, then you have here the square, here triangle, and now look, this blue, dark blue, Part and the red part, I can move by translations from the square to the triangle. The other ones, the purple one at the green, I have to rotate about 180 degrees. So it's very easy going from here to here. But there is a part. This triangle has no parallel side to the initial square. Yeah. Very complicated angles, and if you analyze this problem, you will find it's not easy. Though I tried to find deceptions from a square to an equal area, equilateral triangle, such that the square and the triangle have one side, parallel side. There are solutions. Here you see the first one. 
Of course, I need more parts. And you see, again, we have here this slanting road. For instance, this part you can just move by translation to this one. I need translations and rotations. For instance, this red triangle, you have to rotate. There is no symmetry at all in both the sections. Here you have another solution. Here, all but one part can be moved by translation. It's just this red triangle you have to rotate. And every else you can do with translations only. And here, a third solution. Here we have symmetry. The square has a central symmetry, and triangle has an axial symmetry. But now it's more difficult to come from the square to the triangle. For instance, this yellow triangle, you can have first to move by translation, then it's here, and then you have to reflect above. So it's a slight reflection for this yellow part. And same thing, for instance, this uh, magenta, you have, can move and then reflect both. Again, we have here a kind of slanting road. I think this is a cue to find these common deceptions. For me, it's just uh, fun to, to find this. Thanks. Now, this is what shouldn't be happening. I've learned at this conference that you have to say oops in this situation. <laughs> you said it several different times. Now, a uh, new example, and will be the last one in my talk, it goes back to Euclid. In his second book, has the problem to cut a given lane, it's the baseline here, such that this rectangle and the square here have the same area. This is the first situation in the book of Euclid, where the golden ratio comes in. And it's before he speaks about the golden ratio in the fifth book. So it's just a didactical situation. It begins something which comes later. Now, what's the point of deception here? If you take x, and of course the big square is 1, then we have 1 minus x. Area of the rectangle is here, 1 minus times 1 minus x should be equal to x squared, and if you solve this equation, you get the golden ratio, here, numerical value. Now the question is, can I find a dissection from this rectangle to the square here? First, I try with an algorithm which I like to call the green algorithm. I take the biggest part which fits in both in the rectangle and the square. So this is the yellow rectangle here. Then again, the biggest is this one. And now you realize that the leftovers in gray have the same shape, the same form as the initial problem. That means going on with this algorithm, I will never come to an end. Of course, finally, I will have a dissection plus with a nine infinite with a no finite number of parts. And when one can discuss if this is dissection proof or not. We have a kind of funnel symmetry at this point. 
the reason behind this problem is that the Gordon ratio is an irrational number. So you can't do it in this way. But there's another solution. I just begin again. Take this triangle, a copy of them here, and now I have two parallelograms in the center, which have not the same form. But with just, just one cut, I can come to an end. So this red equals to this one, and here we have this one. Now just another situation. Here again, you see this slanting road. Actually, it's the direction of the diagonal of this rectangle. This is so-called golden rectangle. We have the golden ratio again. I like here to come to a picture of my friend Jo Niemeyer. He walked a lot with the golden ratio. Thank you. respecting deeply the time, time, time limits. So uh, I, I could see a lot of connections with uh, several people's work uh, in the room. I see some connections with uh, the polyuniverse uh, coloring system. Uh, Janusz Saxon uh, had a lecture on this and I no. Can I, okay, and I know that uh, George Darvash also worked uh, on a beautiful uh, golden section puzzle, which also might have some connections uh, with this uh, system. But you and thinking, way of thinking, what you introduced us. So I would like to ask for you short questions and short answers. We have some minutes for that. So Larry. A short question. Uh, several slides where you were going from the larger pattern to the smaller and smaller pattern. It looks like a fractal, is it? You know what I mean? I you know what no, I mean? The, uh, because that's it's what you mean. I would say it's not a fractal. You can use the switch of that, or we will use only this. Okay. I would say it's not a fractal because there's only one part. It's just a geometric sequence. Now, one can discuss what the fractal yeah. is. Mm -hmm. I think it's not. Okay, long discussion. Yeah. Okay. So leave it. Other question, comment? Okay. If there is no more, then we are quickly setting up uh, for Natalia Budinski, our next speaker. She will present from this computer. Okay. And uh, while we are setting up, I would like to quickly introduce uh, Natalia as well to you. So I'm very happy for Natalia in our session because uh, she is a real practicing teacher. So maybe the uh, only one in our section who works um, in um, a real high school with uh, real high school children. And uh, Natalia is uh, arrived from uh, Serbia, from Ruski Krestur, uh, from Europe's only Ruthenian language high school. And uh, she's an expert uh, on uh, how to connect uh, origami and uh, you can switch the projector as well, please. So, uh, as expert at how to connect, you should connect this without maybe without the adapter. Yeah. She's an expert on how to connect uh, origami and uh, mathematics education in practice and uh, I was proud to be a co-author of uh, some papers uh, from uh, Natalia and we hope to see uh, the presentation as well soon.
there and we are ready to set off and all these beautiful models that uh, she brought uh, to us uh, will play a role also in the talk and uh, that's also a happy thing that uh, Natalia will be with us uh, also during the family day. So. Candy origami. I don't know if you are familiar with candy origami. 
uh, it is colored because it is made of paper, candy paper. So, I got material for today's session. Which I want to help me. Oh. So, yes, 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 yes. So, when you wrap off the candy, you get a perfect square. So you can fold a frame or maybe a heart. Or I don't know, there would maybe a butterfly. There are a lot of possibilities. So shall we make a tree? Or maybe you prefer using regular paper. And then on the on by the diagonal, fold by the diagonal. Many of 
siguiente. And then put up this part and this part up and the same on the other side. And then fold, make a little folds over here. And do the same on the both sides. Akira Yajisawa, he dedicated his life to the okay, uh, origami. Um, he constructed about 5,000 5, uh, origami models and described it in the 18 books. It, uh, he used symbols in the describing and that uh, gave uh, mathematicians um, a base to develop uh, theorems and uh, ori uh, origami axioms and how that was the way how mathematics and origami met. He, for example, uh, uh, this kind of fold uh, name it, named uh, volley fold and this one is mountain fold, this one is described with this kind of line and the other one is with the lines and dots. And then 
uh, there is a theorem. Uh, we can try to pro uh, to explain it in uh, practice because it's very real. Uh, you can take a piece of paper and put a, uh, a spot on the paper, and then make a arbitrary number of folds. And when you count the folds, uh, uh, valley folds and mountain folds, the difference between the number of mountain and valley folds is always two in a flat origami, meaning the origami that is uh, like these hearts or uh, cranes. And this uh, theorem is uh, called Mekawa's theorem. The consequence of the theorem is that it's always possible to color regions of the flat origami with two colors. So there is the, 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 the mathematics there is where the mathematics star, and you can see a lot of, lot of symmetry. So symmetry is a, one of the fundamental part of geometry, nature, and space uh, shapes, and uh, it is a part of national curriculum in elementary and high school. These are the pictures of my drawings of my students. So, uh, for example, I use modular origami for teaching uh, symmetries. Uh, and I would like to uh, present you a short movie. Okay. About how it looks in the classes. There's no sound, but it's only music, so. So we are uh, we are making these origami models in order to uh, to explore different kinds of symmetries. So, for example, bilateral symmetry, rotational symmetry is more obvious when you make a model. Uh, modular origami is so because uh, there are models made and these uh, objects are. found 
there, there are only five platonic solids, so it's also interesting to the students when they are making them. And after we are playing with the assembling cubes, dodecahedrons, octahedrons, we are learning these formulas. So it's more interesting like that. This is our in the classroom. We are, uh, we are doing also workshops, promotions, of promotional events when we want to show that mathematics has its other side and you can find more on this blog and this is how it started. Our, uh, how, how origami in the classroom become like, very, very, uh, very good and applicable. Uh, Natalia for uh, this experience oriented uh, talk. Thank you for the candies and uh, thank you for the eye candies as well so you can see that how easy to uh, get some engagement and motivation in mathematics uh, when it's presented in a proper way. So you can see also uh, my main reasons of dwelling uh, into the magical world of uh, origami uh, as well. This uh, uh, photo was taken in, in Belgrade, actually in the same uh, symposium where we could work together with uh, Professor Slavik Jablan. That was uh, one of the last uh, occasions uh, uh, where we could actively uh, work together. Uh, yes, uh, so, uh, and uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for, for this talk. And, uh, we will meet you also tomorrow at the family day in the afternoon and uh, we will have uh, several interesting uh, programs and we will have the opportunity also to learn about origami. Uh, there is a place again for one short question and one short answer. Hans. Yes, um, did you actually develop some uh, teaching materials Apart from um, apart from the diagrams, uh, teaching materials, say stating, for instance, your formulas or other things related like, to uh, teaching plans. Or teaching plans, yes. Yes, there, there are uh, there are some in the Serbian base of good practices. There are some examples how to uh, implement origami in math lessons, like. Uh, introduction, like how to connect with uh, certain mathematical topics, uh, certain mathematical lessons. Uh, that is how I'm how I'm doing. There are also there is also paper to solution on, of one unsolvable problem when when the problem of Dublin cube when students learning volume of the s geometrical solids, then it can be represented by this origami when they have to make a. A cube with double volume, for example, and there, uh, this is that is actually on the actual real life lessons, uh, right in the curriculum applied. So, no. yes. Thank you very much. It was very very interesting and very very impressive to do something with that with your hands. Because with my hands I cannot. Tomorrow, uh, if you uh, family day uh, workshop, there will be more time to uh, for uh, explain different kinds of applying origami in math lessons. So if you are available, you can come. Okay, so even if the other members of your family are not here, you represent the family, so you can go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, it's not my, not my pleasure and my honor to present people who don't need to be presented. Because if you don't know who they are to, today, that's a real problem. So it's my honor to, to introduce the, the talk by, uh, you know, I, I need to read because at my age it's impossible to remember. Uh, by, by Christoph and, uh, and Diego. Christoph is from uh, Finland, from University of Jyväskylä, 
and Diego is from Austria, he's a neighbor. He can, uh, no, actually, you are from Johannes Kepler University in Linz, and uh, please, we will enjoy your talk. Thank you so much, uh, Noah, for the kind introduction. Uh, yes, you mentioned uh, it's a real problem to not knowing us, but uh, yes, and it connects well uh, to the topic of our talk because we will uh, try to talk about real problem solving, solving of real uh, problems in uh, mathematics um, education. And uh, Diego was smiling when uh, he was introduced as somebody from Austria. I was smiling uh, when I was introduced as somebody of, uh, from Finland. It's a half of the symmetrical half of the truth. Uh, I'm originally from Hungary, but living uh, 10 years ago in Finland. And uh, Diego is uh, originally from Brazil and Argentine, yeah. uh, uh, but uh, now at the moment uh, uh, having a, a grant, a research grant uh, at the Johannes Kepler University. And uh, actually uh, the person uh, who connected us uh, is also uh, sitting here, uh, Professor Joad Lavica from Cambridge, Linz, Budapest and uh, more and more uh, everywhere. Uh, and uh, he's a research uh, director and um, community director of uh, GeoGebra, GeoGebra, a software uh, which is very widely used uh, also in European education, but more and more spread uh, in the US um, education and all over the world, more than 30 million uh, users at the moment. And Jot uh, will introduce us uh, this system uh, tomorrow morning in a framework of a plenary talk. And now, uh, to not go dramatically too much over time, uh, we also decided to shorten uh, our talk uh, today, because uh, tomorrow morning from 9.30, unfortunately, Daniela Bertol from New York City uh, could not make it uh, to be with us tomorrow morning. So we decided uh, to make an extended talk uh, tomorrow in connection uh, with uh, this topic when we also present about the context uh, of this approach and also uh, get a bit more deeper in, deeper in the methodological uh, approach behind uh, connecting uh, uh, hands-on and uh, digital modeling in uh, the problem-solving uh, framework in, in, in mathematics education. So, our illustration uh, for uh, this uh, method is uh, the hands-on uh, construction of a large-scale geodesic dome. Uh, the dimensions of this dome, uh, it's five diameters is the, uh, 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 of the uh, basement area. Uh, and uh, the height uh, of the structure is, uh, is three meters. And uh, maybe you not see it or cannot expect uh, from the picture, but it's consisted of almost 1,000 uh, modules because we are using double connectors uh, and so on. And each uh, of the pieces uh, have a certain place in the structure. So if you place uh, one uh, piece on a wrong place, then the whole structure will not work. And uh, mostly uh, we construct um, uh, this dome as a, uh, in, a, in a framework of a collaborative uh, problem solving uh, uh, session or a, or a process where uh, groups uh, of students uh, work together on each uh, side or each slice uh, of the dome and usually these small groups uh, are also have to cooperate with other groups maybe with those groups whom they not meet personally because for example we have three times 60 minutes uh, session and the first session 25 students second session again 25 students and 25 students in the first se third session and when the dome is ready, in the end, after these three hours of uh, intensive problem solving, then these people who worked on the dome come together, go inside the dome, and uh, discuss uh, on, on, on whatever they understood uh, during the process, what uh, they have learned uh, during the, the, the process, and um, also so there is uh, this model of uh, uh, this higher and higher macro level cooperation and micro level cooperation uh, in the framework uh, of, of building. And uh, how we connect uh, this, 
uh, with, with digital uh, modeling is that, uh, that uh, when you work physically on this big structure, learning by doing, uh, you supposed uh, to uh, not only see and not only understand, but to able to make uh, uh, the, the, the difficult uh, uh, complex structure. And uh, when you have also the digital uh, 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 support at hand, uh, then it also can support the building process, step by step building process, and also measure several things uh, during the building process, angles, uh, identify different kind of triangles uh, in, the, in the structure, and also uh, visualizing uh, different kind of symmetries uh, within uh, this highly organized, uh, uh, very uh, structure with very interesting symmetrical properties. So change the coloring uh, when, when, when you are ready or, or when, when you work, which would be very hard to do uh, with the physical tool to quickly change uh, colorings, but you can recolor it uh, during the building process and you can visualize uh, several kind of connections which might be very hard uh, to see uh, uh, in, in, the, in the process. So and where do we come from uh, to this object, well, how we connect it uh, to real life? So uh, in Finland uh, there was a very interesting project by an international group of architects who were experimenting uh, with, um, for example, the construction or building the world's largest ice dome, which was ever uh, realized. And they used uh, this system of a wire framework and putting an inflatable uh, uh, under uh, this wire framework. And they started to spray ice uh, on air water on the, on, the, on the surface. And as it uh, um, cooled down on minus 25 or minus 30, which is normal in this region in, in, in Finland uh, during the winters. They got uh, this beautiful uh, dome uh, in the end, a beautiful Faller uh, dome, that beautiful geodesic dome uh, in the end. And we were invited uh, by these architects uh, to uh, make an educational project uh, to show to the students uh, about their structural thinking and uh, and about um, this uh, building building process, and then we started uh, to develop um, our our project. There were uh, several uh, sources and several other successful examples. Uh, for example, uh, Rinus Rolovs uh, have uh, a beautiful modular uh, kit based on Leonardo da Vinci's uh, drawings uh, to uh, build uh, domes. And of course, we have the very famous uh, Jena uh, dome, which was also uh, inspiring uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, to come up uh, with his uh, famous uh, structure, what he was popularizing uh, very um, successfully uh, in, in architecture. And uh, there is a corresponding picture with uh, Natalia's talk. Uh, uh, this is, these are Natalia's students um, uh, constructing the Epcot uh, ball, which is also uh, based on this uh, uh, triangular structure, and we know uh, several other examples. I won't go now into details um, of how you obtain this geodesic dome. Many of you know, many of you already uh, know it well, but we will have more time uh, tomorrow to, to, to get into uh, details. What uh, might be important for us uh, for now in this quick introduction is that uh, our dome's so-called frequency is uh, number six. Uh, so uh, this gives also uh, the different uh, length of each uh, of the uh, struts, uh, what is used, each of the sticks, uh, what is used uh, in, the, in, the, in the structure. So you can see that how many different lengths of sticks uh, have the students deal uh, during the building process. And also, you can see on this quickly uh, fleshed up presentation that 
how many uh, symmetrical parts uh, can be identified and should be identified to solve the problem of building up uh, this dome. Of course, uh, we start the building process uh, on the top. Uh, it's uh, also an, an interesting um, uh, approach, a top, top down approach, uh, what, what we are uh, employing uh, during the building process. And actually, uh, usually only the first step is determined, uh, and then uh, we get into the problem solving uh, process to try uh, to put this together. And also, uh, the teachers are much more in a kind of a facilitator role, so we're not instructing uh, too much, uh, try to motivate uh, rather uh, the problem solving process, the thinking process, and that's how, again, the computer assisted uh, modeling uh, means a big help, because in uh, Diego's applets, what he developed uh, for us uh, and for this project, uh, there are several features uh, can be explored, uh, so the students don't have to feel alone, but they can turn to the computer uh, to ask several questions in a certain way, and if, you, if they have the good question, they will have the good solution. So uh, this, 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 this is uh, the, the process, uh, what, what is happening, and of course, several other uh, symmetries uh, can be identified, which uh, can be also shown uh, by the computer uh, in, a, in a later phase. About the material setting, I also won't go details now. I just uh, tell you that uh, this is a Korean uh, tool, uh, what we are using, it's called 4D Frame, and it has an interesting connection of the traditional Korean architecture, which I will introduce uh, more deeper uh, in tomorrow uh, morning and also an interesting connection uh, to the Finnish uh, culture because <laughs> this uh, uh, strange structure is uh, the most basic uh, Christmas decoration in Finland and in Sweden. It's called uh, Himmeli in, in Finnish and uh, you can see it's also a beautiful example of ethno-mathematics what we can uh, see here but it's also consisted uh, just the uh, tubes um, and um, connecting uh, the tubes uh, on, a, on a certain way. This is made of straw, uh, actually. And this is how we start off uh, with the geodesic dome, uh, constructing, and you can see uh, the steps. I won't show now pictures on uh, when the students are doing it, you will uh, see it tomorrow when we will have more time to explain about the method. It's just more uh, a foretaste on, on how do we, do we do this. And now I give the floor uh, to Diego, uh, who will explain more about uh, the software that is supporting this process. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, Christoph, and the opportunity to talk here a little bit. Actually, I have to say I was introduced by this fantastic approach uh, developed by Christoph two months ago. So since there, I, I was uh, analyzing and, and uh, developed some applets by myself to, to understand and to think about some possibilities to, to implement in, in Method education uh, uh, approach. So first, I have developed the the, the main uh, pattern in a, in a dome, uh, and here in this applet, I would like uh, show and share with you uh, how can I. Uh, I have to to change the the.
resolution. <coughs> yeah, but in the, the screen resolution from the, the computer, can you change? Is share with you. How can I construct the the the, the geometric uh, the geodesical dome um, from a uh, ecosystem? So I have two uh, bottles more, but uh, uh, unfortunately we can see it now. But the main idea is uh, start from a uh, ecosystem. So uh, the second step is point out the the grid on uh, the one phase of the ecosystem and project the rays from the center of the ecosystem and project the, this uh, point from the, the, the grid on the face over the, the sphere. Uh, unfortunately, I can sh uh, show you now, but this is the, the idea, project this point over the, the, the face of ecosystem on the, the, the sphere and mark the, these points and construct the, the structure. So, uh, but here I particularly interested in, in identify some uh, patterns and more than this is change the different um, frequency that we have in a, a geometric dome. So here we have a, a model with uh, two frequencies. Uh, it's just one phase, no? Three, four, five, and six, as Christoph uh, have developed with uh, the students in, in a physical way. I have developed this because I'm particularly interested in, in compare uh, digital models and physical models at the same time in manipulative sense. Um, so, this is the first effort that I developed. Uh, the interesting here is we can identify the different triangles that we have. We have, um, for instance, six equilateral uh, triangles, and uh, I think four more uh, or three uh, different kinds of isosceles triangles and one escalene uh, triangle, one kind of. Triangle. Uh, so the idea is to identify the, the different uh, shapes and possibilities, angles, <coughs> and in the other uh, model, let me see, what is it? Okay. The uh, number I, three. I, uh, yeah, I think this. Okay. This. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Important, I can change this, but I will try in a different uh, way. Let me see here. graphics. Let's see that. Mm, no. Ah, maybe if you put here. No. Or if you put this away. Here I developed another uh, applet where you can see step by step the construction. So here is the first step. Uh, because as uh, Christoph said uh, before, the, usually the students can construct but can uh, identify exactly which kind of triangles or which kind of properties they, they have in a physical way. So here I, I put uh, with the, the colors the, the different steps. And here I, I put the, the number of pieces that you need to, to construct this. And below here, unfortunately we can't see, I, I put some boxes to change the, the patterns there. Uh, 
for example, we can see only the, the red pattern or only the, the red pattern. I will try in a different way here. Let me see if you can. Maybe here, yeah. This is the algebra um, uh, view from GeoGebra. Here. Just to give some example, uh, here I can change and put just the, the <coughs> purple pattern, and we can uh, combine uh, purple and red, purple and green, purple, green, and red to, to analyze the different kinds. Uh, we have. Actually, this is m much more easy, but uh, we can see now. And here, at the same time, I, I put the, the, the length of the different colors. And I think uh, at the moment is this, it's just to, to illustrate the, these ideas and uh, sharing with you. These uh, materials are available in the GeoGebra platform, so it's totally free if you want to interest in, in, in download and adapt it and uh, transform. So I think is that. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, just to share with you, the problem was that, that we couldn't uh, manage to compose the resolution between the computer and the projector. So if we will find it <laughs> for tomorrow to uh, uh, make compatible the projector and the computer, you will find, see, it's, it's very easy to do uh, with, with sliders. Uh, just to change coloring and uh, illustrate uh, all this symmetry. Uh, uh, combinations and constellations. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your um, attending this session and uh, for your patience. And uh, we will try to share more and a bit more uh, proper way uh, details about this project uh, tomorrow uh, morning. If you have any questions and patience, then oh, uh, is, is this geogebra uh, yeah. is this geogebra file public? Okay. Yeah, 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 it's totally high, uh, public, uh, in the geogebra materials. Yeah, this this file you can find in there is. Uh, Okay, so you can find in the GeoGebra platform GeoGebra materials, uh, or looking for my name Diego Lieben, and you can reach. Them. Okay, any more questions or comments? If not, uh, then welcome you back at five o'clock when Professor Haras Lavani uh, will make a plenary talk today. Thank you very much.